Hey guys, my name is Emma and today I'm going to be doing something just a little bit different on my channel here. It's really common to see on booktube videos which are linking to books where if you liked one then you'll probably like the other. Now I'm doing something quite similar today but rather than linking two books together what I thought I'd do is I'd say if you like this book maybe try this TV show or movie or indeed if you like this TV show or movie maybe check out this book. So I've got six books and then their corresponding TV or movie to talk to you about today and I'm going to be going in order from the most similar to the least similar. Um, as a side note, sorry about the state of my hair, I've just got out of the shower. Uh, so it's only just really kind of drying off so it looks a little bit wacky today, but that's absolutely fine. Um, so we're just going to get started really. So the first book I'm going to be talking about today is A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers and I'm going to be linking it with the TV show Firefly. So this sci-fi book follows a collection of characters on a spaceship as they travel through space um, doing a variety of different odd jobs here or there. And in a similar fashion Firefly is also about a collection of quirky characters also on a spaceship flying through space doing a collection of odd jobs. So funnily enough the two link rather closely together. So in case you haven't heard of it, Firefly is a TV series that is from the very very early 2000s that was made by Joss Whedon at the same time as kind of Buffy and Angel and all of that was going on with him. Um, it only lasted for one season to the eternal despair of all of its fans now. Um, I do believe it was Fox that cancelled it and there was also a movie that followed on straight from it. There's about 13 or 14 episodes. Um, they used to be on Netflix but I don't think they are anymore um, but you can get them on Amazon Prime. It's quite easy to find them. Uh, the similar similarities between these two is unbelievable. Um, I watched Firefly years ago, I've been into the TV show for such a long time, I think I've watched all the episodes at least 10 times if not 20 times through um, and I read this just earlier this year. Um, it's a really good book uh, but I do think it mirrors Firefly very very closely and I actually found that almost distracting for me when I was reading it. The similarities between the characters are there, the similarities between some of the plot lines are there. Um, I'm not saying it by any stretch of the imagination that Becky Chambers has plagiarised Firefly in the slightest but just tonally speaking I think that they are so unbelievably similar that every second reading this felt a little bit like deja vu. Um, if somebody had taken Firefly, given it a bigger prosthetics budget and then written it down in book form, that is kind of the vibe I got from this one. Um, not a criticism at all because I really really like Firefly. If you are a fan of Becky Chambers' um, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet then you will definitely a big fan, be a big fan of Firefly and indeed vice versa. Um, it's quite difficult to tell with this one which has been the more popular of the two because this only came out quite recently but it's been making waves in booktube. I know a lot of people have been mentioning it. Um, I think I first heard about this from either Little Book Owl or Emma's Books, um, whereas Firefly has been around for now coming up to, um, I think it's been about 15 years, if not slightly longer. Um, so it's it's been around for ages and it's very much a kind of cult classic. The next book I have to talk about is actually the sequel to A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet and that is A Closed and Common Orbit, again funnily enough by Becky Chambers. This one I'm going to be linking with Bicentennial Man which is a movie from uh, 1999. So A Closed and Common Orbit actually takes two of the secondary characters from A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet and kind of takes them off in their own direction. There's a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence and what it means to be human, what it means to be a person um, and also genetic modification as one of the main characters is an AI that's recently been put into more of a human type shape and the other main character is somebody who has had a fair amount of genetic work done to her in the past. Um, I'm linking this with Bicentennial Man, the movie from 1999 which has got Robin Williams um, playing the main robot character which basically it's his journey in discovering again what it means whether he can become a human, whether he can become considered a person and just what it means to be conscious and sentient. Um, I think both are fantastic, Robin Williams it goes without saying is an incredible actor, um, an absolute legend. I really liked to close and common orbit as well, I actually preferred it to the first book because I think it did more interesting things and opened up far more interesting discussions about personal identity and, and stuff like that and what I really like is sci-fi that makes you think and makes you start to question some of the stuff that you know about your own life um, whereas I felt like I, um, the first one A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet just felt a little bit flat for me in comparison and didn't have that same sort of uh, questioning nature. Um, Stylistically they are very different because Bicentennial Man is very much set in relatively modern day, give or take, um, but definitely there aren't any aliens or other planets or spaceships or anything freaky, whereas the Close and Common Orbit is indeed
indeed set in the exact same world as A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. We are talking full on sci-fi, we've got your spaceships, your alien species, different languages, like the works. Um, so stylistically one is definitely more softcore sci-fi before getting into kind of the more hardcore areas that Becky Chambers is going for, but I do think if you're a fan of one check out the other, especially given that Bicentennial Man is quite an old movie now and you might not have seen it before and I think it's wonderful. Like it, it has aged obviously but I think it's brilliant. I didn't realise that nearly everything I was talking about today had at least some elements of sci-fi or speculative fiction in it. So if you're not a fan of that and you like strict contemporary thriller type stuff, maybe stop watching now, sorry. Um, but the next book I have to talk about is How to Stop Time by Matt Haig. Um, this has been making waves towards the beginning of the year. Um, it is about a man who does not age. Um, nice and simple and I am linking it with the movie Age of Adeline which is about a woman who does not age. We're seeing the connections here. I did my research. Um, both of them at their heart are really kind of a, a love story in a lot of ways. Um, How to Stop Time I think takes the concept and goes a little bit further with it. Um, so in How to Stop Time Tom the main character has not been aging for significantly longer than in the Age of Adeline. Um, and has been around for a good couple of hundred years. He's also part of a society which is involved with trying to protect people who don't age and is part of kind of a bigger network of people like that. In the age of Adeline, however, Adeline is unique and is the only one with her abilities that she is aware of and it comes from a freak accident um, and it's really just a much shorter time span. It's mainly looking at sort of 150 years, probably no more than that. Um, both of them I think are very very strong. For me the strongest thing for both of these is the historical elements that you're touching on. Um, the details of Tom's life going back in the sort of previous hundreds of years and his time to get to where he is now um, is absolutely fascinating. Adeline's experiences looking at kind of time in the 60s and the 70s, times with the war, all that jazz, again really really interesting and adding those lovely historical elements that I would really want from something that's talking about, um, I guess the opposite of time travel, time suspension if that's even a thing. If you're a fan of one you will like the other one. This one I'm going to go in a bit of a reverse because I'm pretty sure that the movie franchise is significantly bigger than the book I'm about to talk about and that is the Jurassic Park slash Jurassic World series. Uh, I flip in love these movies. I, if you are a big fan of them then you should totally check out uh, The Great Sea of China by Matthew Riley. So the main character in this book, CJ, is an expert on reptiles and all things lizard-like and she gets called to a top secret zoo in China to look at some of their animals um, and it turns out that the animals that they're looking at are actually dragons. They found dragon eggs and they have managed to hatch them and they are indeed trying to have a zoo of dragons which is very very cool. Now because I've linked it with the Jurassic World franchise, you guessed it, the dragons don't really stay in their cages for very long and chaos ensues. Um, again I think that this is just wicked fun. It's a really entertaining book. It's not to be taken seriously in the slightest but I think it is brilliantly done and if you're a fan of the slightly wacky quirky faint ridiculousness that is the Jurassic Park franchise then I would definitely check this one out. Another book that I wanted to talk about is Sleeping Giants and I have linked this book with Arrival. So uh, Sleeping Giants I actually listened to an audiobook which I think is an excellent format for it. Um, it's book one of the Themis files which I have talked about on my channel before because I finished book three in my August wrap up. Uh, the reason why the audiobook format is excellent is it's told almost exclusively through reports and um, interviews so the spoken word format is excellent for it. The general gist of book one is basically that a young girl finds a giant metal hand buried underneath the ground and then when she is older and a scientist and gets a chance to study it it turns out to be linked to a whole host of other body parts that have been buried all across the world that join together to form one giant metal robot that is actually being gifted to us by aliens. Um, so yeah, so that's that's pretty quirky. Uh, if you haven't seen Arrival, Arrival is a movie where 12 giant metal discs um, land at various points across the, the world and on board are aliens who do not speak our language. The Americans call in a linguist to try and decipher 
their language and form some kind of communication. One thing that I think they both do brilliantly is really talk about the science behind everything. So in Arrival there's all sorts of information about um, linguistics and how we develop languages and how we can understand each other and in Sleeping Giants there's a whole bunch of information about um, the composition of the metal and how it works and kind of the physics involved with it. They also do find um, a tablet which has got loads of information which is thought to be the basis of their language so you do get that that real similarity between trying to decode an alien language between both stories but I think um, Sleeping Giants just takes it a little bit further. There's also linkings with the idea of military and working across countries and military operations and what that means um, and so the politics in both of them is really really strong. There are elements to both that are not that they are kind of mutually exclusive to to themselves but i think that they are um both brilliant and i would totally check them out i am fully aware that the two of the things that i've now told you guys which is jurassic park and arrival are both based off of either books or short stories themselves so i do know that if you do like them you could just go read the originals but i'm trying to link them to other things for you um, and I now have one final book that I wanted to talk about and this is probably my uh, weakest link of all of them uh, but just just bear with okay just roll with so again I'm pretty sure for this one the movie franchise that I'm on about is going to be way bigger than the book because I've literally never heard anybody talk about this book before in my life so if you are a fan of either Mad Max Fury Road or some elements of X-Men you may want to check out the Deadlands by Benjamin Percy. This is a dystopian fiction where a flu virus has wiped out 99.9% .9 of our population. And I know what you're thinking, hang on a minute, does that sound similar to Station Eleven? I think you'll find it does. However, while Station Eleven was only set 20 years in the future, this one is 150 years in the future. So all of those lovely nuclear power plants we currently have with all sorts of fail safes, yeah, that goes a bit wrong. Um, so basically, the whole world is pretty much screwed, we've trashed the climate, everything's gone very dusty um, and a bit bit sort of sun torched. Um, most people have some form of weird cancerous lump on them because of the sheer amount of nuclear fallout going on and some of these people do have slightly freaky powers. Um, so the main story is kind of split into two parts and it looks at, and this is where kind of I get the two different linkings. One is a band of intrepid explorers who go out to try and see what they can find and within them there are a few people who have special powers so that's where I'm kind of getting a bit of the X-Men slant from. Um, and then the other story is set in the main town where there is a bit of a water shortage going on and there's everything there which is where I'm kind of getting the Mad Max vibes from. I'm not going to lie, this is probably my loosest linking of all of them. But for me, it really was the tone of this book reminded me of Mad Max in that faintly absurd, bright, bold, colourful, crazy kind of style. This was a roller coaster ride from beginning to end. It's insane and just so much happens and it's such a weird race across country and there's so many different things going on and the setting is just incredible and it really did remind me of that kind of Mad Maxian Fury Road style with the just sheer mentalness that is that movie. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from with, with this one. It's my weakest connection of the two. But I do think if you liked one, you probably would like the other. And if, even if not, like, check out this book. It's really good fun. And nowhere near as many people know about it. So, like, you should totally read it. If you like Station Eleven, I think you'll enjoy this because it's, like, the next logical step. Okay, so that's it from me for this series um if you like this idea do let me know in the comments down below give it a thumbs up whatever because i do find that when i'm reading books i do have a lot of linkings with various tv shows and movies and i like the idea of trying to go kind of cross medium when looking at comparisons do you have any books or movies that you often connect up in your head if you do please let me know in the comments down below i will chat to you soon bye